And so today we're going to uh, continue on our theme, a new theme, uh, of building for our future on our glorious past. And our message today is going to come from 2 Chronicles. So if you brought your Bible, you want to jump into 2 Chronicles. Now, that's a little bit before the middle of your Bible, in 2 Chronicles. And we want to start at chapter 3. So I'm going to give you just a moment to find it. It's a pretty big book, so you should be able to find it without going to the index. But when all else fails, just go to the index of your Bible and find the page number it's on, and you will, you'll find it there. Building for our future on our glorious past. This is a kind of um, a background message for the next uh, four weeks. Uh, we need to learn a little bit about the temple and uh, Solomon's construction of that to make sense out of the next series of uh, lessons that we're going to do about our glorious past. That's what I want to focus on today, our glorious past. And as we do so, uh, our glorious past is a lot like the temple's glorious past. Uh, Solomon's temple, which uh, sat, uh, sat, you know, today where the Dome of the Rock is in Jerusalem, uh, it had a glorious past. And uh, it sat up upon Mount Moriah. In fact, that's uh, what we're going to find in our first text. Solomon, in chapter 3, verse 1, says, Then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord uh, in Jerusalem, on Mount Moriah. Now, those of you who have read through your Bibles, you might uh, remember, hey, Mount Moriah. I remember that name from somewhere else. And there's another place in the Bible where Mount Moriah was. In fact, Mount Moriah is the place where God told Abraham to take his son, his only son, his only begotten son, is what the text says. He took his only son and sacrificed him. So he rounded up uh, his servant, and, and he took his servant with him. This is back in chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 21, 22, right in that, that section. He, he, he took his servant, he took a donkey, he took some fire, he took some wood, and he took his son, and he said, uh, we're going to go to Mount Moriah, and uh, you and the, he says to the servant, you and the donkey, you stay here while the lad and I go and, here's the word, worship. First time the word worship's used in the, the Bible. Well, the lad and I go and worship. The very time, first time the word worship is used is used for this mountain, Mount Moriah, where the temple is being built. It was a place David had set aside to have the temple built because God wouldn't let David build the temple. He said, no, but your son will build the temple. Mount Moriah, because on Mount Moriah something unusual happened. God told Abraham to offer up his only son Isaac through whom the promises, all the promises he had made uh, to Abraham were to be fulfilled. And Abraham, a man of absolute faith, incredible faith, went to Mount Moriah and laid his son on the altar. His son says to him, hey, I see that you got the wood, you got the fire, and we got the altar. But he said, where's the sacrifice? And, and Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. The time came for the, the sacrifice to take place. Abraham lifts his hand up with a dagger in it, and he's about to plunge it in his son's chest and sacrifice his only begotten son through whom all the promises were made. And out of heaven came a voice that told him to stop. Now I know that you really trust me. And in the, ram, in, in, in the thickets was caught a ram, and, and the ram was a substitute for his son, and he sacrificed and God said, I really know now you truly trust me. The book of Hebrews, later in the, in the Bible, chapter 11, it tells us that uh, Abraham believed God so strongly, he believed that God would have to raise his son from the dead because God had given his word that through his son all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So in order to fulfill that promise, God's going to have to raise up his son. Instead, God, God stopped him because he saw that he believed God. And the Bible later says that faith was counted for righteousness. Abraham was a saved man. He had the imputed righteousness of Christ who was yet to come imputed to him because he simply believed God. Folks, this is worship. You come to a place of worship it's a place where you bring an offering and a sacrifice. We did that already. You brought your offering, but he wants more than just our money. He wants us as his offering. We lay down our lives. Romans chapter 12 says that, it says 
We are to be living sacrifices. We lay our lives on the altar. He wants our heart first. He wants us. And then everything that flows from that, and he will bless us. So there on Mount Moriah was the beginning. The foundation is laid. You read a little further in the passage, you find that it's like 60 cubits by 30 cubits. And so it's like 90 feet uh, by 45 feet wide. And, and it, it starts to lay the foundation of the sanctuary and all that. And you read that. You know, Bethany has had a glorious beginning too. Not, not just that glorious beginning, but, but there was this gal, Mary Barnett. She'd gone to school in Chicago and she went to the Baptist Missionary Training School. And, 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 but she was called of God to start a church. She didn't know it at the time. She just came back to the Pontiac area here and under you know, the First Baptist Church pastor who was her mentor, encouraged her to start a Sunday school class on the west side of Pontiac that would be too far for most people to walk to church. Think about it, people didn't. They weren't driving too many cars back in 1906 when she first started. No, they were walking to church. And so some people, it's too far to walk, so why don't we start a Sunday school where they're at? And that's what they did. They would go to the, out, out on the edge of town and, and they started a Sunday school and, and 13 years later, boom. Bethany Church is born. September 17th, 1919. She had a vision. She had a missionary passion. She went door to door, we know from the history of the church records, with her Bible in hand. Bethany is a Bible-based church. We call it a Jesus-built church because Jesus said, I will build my church. Where do we find that? We find that in the Bible. We are a Bible church built upon the words of Jesus Christ that I will build my church and she went door to door and rounded up those 24 people to start the very first Bible study. They were growing and rented that storefront. And soon they built that little chapel. Not only did, uh, was, did uh, the temple of old and our church have a, really a glorious beginning, uh, but there was glorious furnishings in the church. There were glorious furnishings in the temple. Now, now watch what I mean. If you jump to chapter 4, verse 1, I'm just skimming here. I'm just skimming. I want you to read your own Bibles, but I want you to see where it's at in the Bible. He made a bronze altar, it says in verse 1. 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide. It was a big altar. And do you see it there? The, the, the bronze altar. He also made, in verse 2, a sea cast metal of metal. And so it says in verse 2, he made the sea of cast metal, circular in shape, measuring it 10 cubits from rim to rim. He gives a description of it. Uh, we, we go a little bit further in verse 4. He made 12 bulls to, to stand upon which that sea of cast metal sat. We read down a little bit further. And he starts describing it. There were 10 basins. He put some on one side, some on the other side, and these were for the priests to ceremonially wash so that they were going about the work of the Lord clean before the Lord because you only approach the Lord with purity. And it's still the same way today. We've got to come to the Lord with a pure heart. Ten golden lampstands were created and they were placed in the, inside the temple. And he talks all about this. And I, I've skipped over so much of, of the description of the temple. But, but you get the idea. There's all these furnishings of this glorious temple. And ten tables are on the inside. Some on one side, some on the other for the placing out of the showbread that they put out every day. He describes it in detail. It goes on and on and on. You know, nothing has really changed. That little small group of Bethany, meeting as a Bible club, you know, a Bible Sunday school class, gathering and growing in number, renting a storefront, says, oh, we, we need a facility. And so they built a facility. Uh, I believe this is the Green Street Church facility. It's still there. You can drive by it today. It's still there. Still there. Green Street Chapel, it was, it was erected in 1912. They named it the Green Street Chapel because the church yet was not incorporated and didn't have a name. It was just meeting. At, the, at that Green Street location. Then in 1928, the church said, we're, we're outgrowing this facility. We need a bigger facility. 
And so they erected uh, the one portion of uh, the facility, this major portion right here, excluding this section right here, in 1928. And the church was, host, was held in that church all the way till 1954. Uh, out in front where this facility, this portion was, I'm told there was actually a log cabin. A log cabin. And some of the people, members of our church, uh, where's Joyce Heiss? Raise your hand over there. Joyce attended Sunday school in the log cabin. Oh, another log cabin, several. Attended Sunday school in the log cabin. Now they are really old. <laughs> I'll bet Indians were still in the territory. <laughs> But in 1954, the congregation is growing. I mean, we've got a glorious past. And they added on this wing, converted part of the other facility into gymnasium. How many of you were in youth group in gymnasium? All right, good. Yeah, look, look at this. This is great. This is great. We have, you see, God was furnishing his church with what his church needed in order to do ministry and bring worship and glory and honor to the true and living God. True and living God. Then in 1989, Bethany moved from the second location to its third location. It's hard to believe that it was 30 years ago. Am I right? How many think it's hard to believe it's been 30 years? I wasn't here 30 years ago, about 20 years ago, though I did come in the parking lot and pray that God would call me to be pastor of this church. I didn't realize. I didn't put a time frame on it, and it took 20 years before he called me here. But, but God has gloriously provided this great facility. Now, since I've been here, we have undertaken a little remodeling, right? Just this past year, this is what it used to look like. That's how it looks like now in our entryway. This is what it used to look like from our uh, lobby, and this is more how it looks like today. Uh, this is how it looked uh, in the lobby, and this is more how it looks today. You know, we did a lot of work this last summer remodeling our lobby area. We, we changed quite a bit around here in our lobby area. And, and this is all part of the furnishings of the church, remodeling, redecorating, and providing a warm atmosphere, a comfortable atmosphere for our guests and our friends that we would like to invite to come and find Jesus as Savior. Embrace him in faith and be baptized and join our church. And you know what? We're not done yet. There are other areas of our building after 30 years need a little updating. And so this might be an ongoing process. And you know what? 10, 15 years from now, we're going to look back and say, all this nice, wonderful updating we've done, is really looking old-fashioned. It's time for it to go and time to redo it because just as the church and our culture is changing, so the body of Christ changes. We don't have any original founding members. They've all passed on. But God is constantly refurnishing his church with the people that his church might grow and continue to grow that the church of Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I will build my church. That's why we're building for the future on our glorious past. We know from our glorious past what God has done before, he can do again. And that should give us and motivate us to have hope. Hope for our future. Well, you know, the original temple finally came to a close. They finished building it. Uh, and we find that it says in chapter 5, verse 1, when all the work Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished. So Solomon said, it's time to cut the ribbon. This church has had several ribbon-cutting ceremonies. You know, back in 1912, 1928, 1954, uh, 1989, and we just had one this year, and we cut the ribbon on just our remodeling. Because things have changed. It was finished. We come to a completion. Now, are we really done? No. It says, when, when the temple of the Lord was finished, finished. He brought in the things his father David had dedicated. Ah, the things. He brought in the things father David dedicated. The silver and gold and all the furnishings. And he placed them in the treasury of God's temple. Isn't that exactly what we did this morning? 
Remodeling's done. We've got a wonderful place, a heated sanctuary. God has blessed us. And yet we brought our offerings in. I've been tempted, but I haven't run it by anybody yet, to just start another envelope offering that says Centennial Offering. To just bring it in above and beyond all the rest. Just bring it in to say, God, this is just something extra. I love you, Lord, and what you're doing in your church, what you're doing in my life. It had a glorious finish. But even though the building was done, the ministry was not they still had to support the ministry. Still had to support, in our case, the electric bill, the gas bill. Still had to support parking lot being cleared. Still had to support maintenance, roof repairs, all those kinds of things, because we're in a 30-year-old building. They kept giving, kept giving, kept giving. It was also, uh, the Solomon's Temple had a, a glorious presence in it, a very glorious presence. When the temple of the Lord was filled, after they completed, down in chapter 5, verse 13, it says, then the temple of the Lord was filled. If you, if you jump to chapter 5, verse 13, actually, I, I want to go to verse 13. It says, and the trumpeters and the singers joined in unison as w with one voice, giving praise and thanks to the Lord. They were singing. Is that what we done? We just had a song service. We were singing and praising. And they were singing and giving thanks and praise to the Lord and accompaniment by the trumpets and cymbals and other instruments. They raised their voice in praise and they sang to the Lord. And here's the song. He is good. His love endures forever. It sounds like a chorus. It sounds like one of those modern contemporary songs. It's just got two lines. They must have sang it a hundred times. The Lord is good. He is good. His love endures forever. And then we hit, then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud. God came down in a cloud. And the priests could not perform their services. Whoa, the cloud. Later we're going to find it was a dark cloud, this dark cloud, because it was probably daytime. In order to notice the cloud, he made it dark. A dark cloud came down, this cloud, for the glory of the Lord Filled the temple of God. Bethany has had a glorious past too, and God has filled Bethany with his glory in the past. Then Solomon said in chapter 6, verse 1, because he goes into a long, lengthy prayer in chapter 6, and we're not going to note that, and we should, but we, we don't have time this morning to note that and everything else. Then Solomon said, The, the Lord had said that he would dwell in a cloud, chapter 6 and verse 1. Uh, I have built a magnificent temple for you, a place for your dwelling. The Lord came down and dwelt in the sanctuary that he had prepared. The glory of the Lord, chapter 5, verse 1, 6, 1, both say, he filled the temple with glory. I think more than anything, my heart's desire for 2019 is that the Lord would fill this place with his glory. That the glory of Bethany would not just be something of our past, but it will be something of our future. That he would manifest his presence here in powerful ways that we had never imagined. Where Jesus said, the works that I have done, you will do, and even greater works than these that God will use this congregation. And the reason he would use this congregation is because this building is not the temple. It tells us in the New Testament because the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed, Solomon's temple was gone, Herod's re rebuilt temple was gone, the temple was gone, but that God the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost in a rushing wind and a flame of fire and he settled as a tongue of fire on the heads of everybody present who was a believer, and he filled them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit that God took up residency in our bodies. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, according to chapter 619 of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 619, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
In chapter 3, verse 16 of 1 Corinthians, not, not, not Chronicles, but Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, it tells us that you are the, that God dwells in your body, and most theologians think there it is referring to you as the church. The church. God's presence is in this place when we assemble as the church. This building is not the church. We, the people, are the church. And when we, be, we come as spirit-filled believers, God's glory will fill this place. Amen. Our glory of our future is greater than our glory of our past. It is. It is. He did have a glorious prayer in chapter 6 when he's dedicating the temple. Oh my goodness, in chapter 6, he's dedicating the temple. There's a phrase in there. He says, I just don't get this, God. The heavens of the heavens, okay, he's saying the heaven of the heavens cannot contain you. This is a, a, a way of saying, God, you are bigger than the universe. Our God is so big. Our God is so big. <laughs> Years ago, I did a, a skit, a little drama with a sermon on, on how big our God is. And, and the preacher, which I was the preacher, said, hey, I need a box. So a person came in with a box. I said, oh, no, no. I need a bigger box. Another person came in, they had a little bigger box. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I need another box. They brought in another box. Each one got bigger. Finally, a guy's dragging in a refrigerator box. And I said, no, 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 I need a bigger box. And, and they, they said, uh, my goodness, what in the world are you putting in the box? I said, well, I'm trying to put God in a box. <laughs> ah. See, Solomon got it. Heaven can't contain you. How in the world are you going to dwell in this little tiny sanctuary that I have built? I said, I just don't get it. He said, I don't get it. We're going to come to this place and we're going to pray here. When, when something happens, I come here, I'm going to pray. And you're going to hear me from heaven and you're going to answer from this place. And, and that's what the whole prayer is about. How God of heaven hears us when we come to this place to pray. And he's praying here in chapter 7. When Psalm had finished praying... Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice. Oh. I, I long for the day when we pray here and a revival fire of the Lord from the Holy Spirit comes down and revives our heart and we go out as a mighty force for God as his army, the church of Jesus Christ, to conquer this world with the gospel, the good news that Jesus is the savior of the world and everyone who believes in him will be saved. And we see a revival build in the church. He said, listen, when he got finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice. Our sacrifice is our body. Look what it says. Fire came down from heaven and it consumed, it consumed up what they had offered, that God was using what they had offered. We were to live, give our lives a living sacrifice. God, consume me. Use me. Use me mightily for you. And the glory of the Lord filled that place. And the priest could not enter the temple because the glory of the Lord was there. God was doing so much, there was no room for them. Wouldn't that be great? That God were doing so much in my life, there was no more room for me. Wouldn't that be great? that God was doing so much that I just, John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease, that the Lord would be doing so much there'd be nothing left for me to do because he'd be doing it all in me. We end this, uh, this foundational passage for our series with a glorious promise. That great beginning, wonderful furnishings, glorious presence, wonderful, glorious prayer. And now we come with this glorious promise. If you ever mark your Bible, here's when you need to mark. Just take and circle that world, if. Chronic, Second Chronicles 7.14. If. You circled that. 
And then right next to that, the condition. Because if I meet this condition, you're going to see later in the text the then. We'll circle that when we get there. He says, if my people, my people, these are the people who know him. They're called by his name. That's what the next part says. Who are called by my name. We're called Christians. I'm being called by the name of Christ. Who is Christ? Christ is the true and living God come in the flesh. If my people, we Christians who bear his name, if we will humble ourselves, he's told his people, if they will humble themselves, not become proud and arrogant and boisterous, but if we would just humble ourselves before God, he must increase, I must decrease. It's all about you, not about me. If my people meet this condition, people who are called by my name, if they meet the condition, they will humble themselves and pray. And pray. And I'm not talking here about praying the grocery list prayer of gimme, 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 gimme. <laughs> Most of our prayers are preoccupied with make somebody well, make somebody well, make somebody well, make somebody well. What if God wanted them sick and in the hospital to be a witness to a nurse or a doctor? Or what if God wanted them to be on hard times so that they had to get out of their own self-reliance and depending upon God? But if my people who are called by my name would just humble themselves and pray and say, not my will be done, but your will be done. Lord, uh, I don't know why this person is stricken with the disaster, the circumstance, the tragedy, the health issue, the financial crisis. I, I don't know. But Lord, make your will known through those circumstances. If my people will pray, not just for everything to be wonderful, but for God to be glorified. That's what this passage is about, the glory of God. And he says, and seek my face. What does that mean? Where, where is God's face? Anybody got a photo of God? Have you taken a selfie lately that you can look and say, oh, I'm looking at the face of God? What does it mean to seek his face? It means you want him to look upon you with favor. You're not really looking at a face. It's a metaphor. It's an imagery that I'm looking and he is looking on me and saying, well done, Dennis. Well done. And put your name in there. Well done. You are doing my will. So what it is talking about here is I'm praying for the will of God to be done. If we as a people, that's a condition, called by his name, I'm a Christian, I humble myself, I, I'm making myself small while he is great, and I'm taking my message to God that I want God's will in my life. It's a dangerous prayer to pray. Because when you ask for God's will in your life, it may not be comfortable. It may be very uncomfortable for you. It may require some suffering. Ooh, this is, you say, wait a minute, preacher. I'm not sure that I want a prayer prayer like that. It's about God's, God's will and what God wants for you, not what you want for you. And here comes the next part. And turn from their wicked ways. I am just blown away how many Christians think we can live an R-rated life and receive God's blessings. He said, no, no, no. You turn, that's called repentance. I turn from what I am doing, I turn from that, and I turn to Christ, I turn to God. These are the conditions. You humble yourself, you pray, you do God's will, and you turn from that dark side that plagues every one of us. Hebrews calls it the sin that so easily besets us or entangles us. It's the one where God, if I could just lick this one, I could walk the perfect Christian life. You turn from that wicked way. And here's the then. Circle that then. If you meet the condition, you get the promise. Put promise with that. Then's the promise. Then's the promise. Then I will hear from heaven. Oh, if you read the previous chapter, chapter 6, he said, I've got this box here, and I know I'm coming to this box, the temple. 
but I can't contain you. But I'm going to pray here, and somehow from heaven, you're going to bring the answer from here to me. And that's what he said. Then, when you meet this condition, then will I hear in heaven, and then I will respond. Look at, I will forgive their sins. I will release you for the guiltiness that you have. Guiltiness means that you have an obligation to satisfy justice. He said, I will pardon you. I will acquit you. I will forgive you. I will release you from the obligation to satisfy justice. How can he do that? Well, because he took all of our guilt and put it on Christ on the cross. And Jesus Christ died for our sins. And then, this is what everybody really wants, but they try to take shortcuts to get there. He says, and I will heal their land, your territory. Whatever your territory is. But we need to meet those conditions as the people of God. As the people of God. Next verse, part of the verse says this. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. God wants to hear from us in this place. Bethany Church, he wants to hear you pray. Bethany can have a glory as a result of being the people of God called by his name, humbling themselves, praying, seeking his face, turning from their wicked way. God will hear us from heaven and he will heal. He will deliver because his eyes will be open, his ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. You know what? It's a new year, 2019. I think that makes it a good year to start, to start building for the future on our glorious past, on our glorious past. With that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we look forward to what you're going to do here at Bethany in 2019. We are a Jesus-built church from the very beginning. When Mary took her Bible, knocked on that first door, you began this great work. When they had that Bible study and she opened up her Bible and she taught, you began this great work. Jesus, you said you would build your church, and here we are a hundred years later, and you're still at work at Bethany. Lord, make us to be the people who meet the condition of the if, so that we can then be the people that get the promise of the then. Hear us, O Lord. Forgive us, O Lord. And heal us, O Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.